My name is Michael Guyad, publisher of The Lead Lag Report. Joining me for the hour is Felix Salmon. Just got a uh, put a great book out we definitely should be touching on. Uh, but Felix, I know a lot of people are familiar with your name. Introduce yourself. Uh, who are you? What's your background? How would you get interested involved in, in markets and in reporting? Uh, and why write? A book. I am Felix Salmon. I am the chief financial correspondent at Axios. I also have a podcast called Slate Money. We are having some fun right now recapping every episode of Succession. So the latest Succession recap came out this morning with Ewan Relly, who some of you might know, investment banker. And I am also, as Michael says, the author of The Phoenix Economy, which is an examination of how the world changed basically over the past three years, and especially since the pandemic hit, I kind of got into financial journalism by default because I didn't wasn't accepted into anything else. I just became a graduate trainee at Euromoney Magazine in London, which is a great place to learn about finances. So basically, my understanding of financial markets is Different from most Americans, I think. I think most people come into markets by looking at the stock market, and I came into markets by looking at the bond market, which, as any bond person will tell you, is a much better way to understand how the world works. So, yeah, I spend a lot of time covering bond markets, especially sovereign debt markets in Latin America. And then in the financial crisis, I started sort of crisis blogging for Portfolio Magazine, which was this short-lived business magazine at Condé Nast. And then I kept on blogging for Reuters and various other places until I wound up at Axios. And, and what was the, the impetus for the book? Why did you decide to uh, put the research together and, and, and put it out there? So the book, yeah, the book was basically, I always had this rule that I wouldn't write a book unless I was uniquely qualified to write it. If this was a book that anyone could write, then I wouldn't write it. I'd let someone else write it because I'm fundamentally lazy that way. And for this one, I realized that I had a kind of breadth of interests that you needed to be able to understand what was happening in the pandemic. There's a lot of anthropology in here, sociology, looking at medicine, looking at history. It's not really a financial book or an economic book at all. It looks at things like compassion and mental health and risk-taking, while also talking about things like you know, the dollar and meme stocks and NFTs and that kind of thing. But like the idea was that the thing that I've always done since I've been blogging since the early 2000s is connecting dots from dis disparate parts of the world and the internet and trying to find bigger themes. And that's really what the book is about. All right. So there's a few things I want to unpack. But first, let's start from the beginning on this point about you entered this field from the bond market side, not the stock market side. You often hear that line that the bond market is smarter than the stock market. It's the student that gets the uh, most consistent A's on exams as opposed to B, B plots of stocks. Um, it, outline for the audience uh, where that where that line of thinking comes from and if in your experience there is that a lot of validity to the idea that bonds understand the world better than stocks. Right. So if you if you think about, say, the classic equity investment, like the, the the most equity of equity investments would be venture capital, where you expect nine out of 10 of your investments to go to zero. But so long as the 10th you know, goes up 50 times, you do really well. The idea behind equity investing is that you are deliberately taking on a bunch of risk. And by definition in stocks, the upside is always bigger than the downside. With the downside, you can never lose more than you invest, whereas the upside is unlimited. So stocks are all about trying to harness those animal spirits and get you know off to the races. What that means is that very risky investments can be priced very highly. And I'm not saying that's irrational, but I'm saying it's a bad guide to reality, right? You're you're betting on like hopes and dreams rather than anything real. Bonds are exactly the other way around. The upside is incredibly limited. You you know, in 90% of states of the world, you know exactly how much you get and you can't do any better than that. You can only the best you can do is for the principal and interest to be repaid in full, which is the base case assumption. But you also have to be really worried about what happens in the case of default. And, you know, 
the downside risks. So bonds are about being very cognizant of what can go wrong and really trying to price that accurately. And that is, it keeps your feet much more on the ground. Yeah, and no, I think that, that's well articulated. And it's that, that I think the focus is much more on return of capital as opposed to on capital. So it's a, it's a higher standard in terms of how to analyze a company because you're lending it. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, obviously, there's always a tension between bondholders and stockholders and and you know they both have really important roles to play in terms of corporate finance but if you are an observer rather than an investor if you are looking at the world and trying to understand you know where the risks are you're more likely to be able to work that out by looking at the bond market than by looking at the stock market now you mentioned then the focus on the sovereign side latin america um i think we'd be remiss if we didn't address the uh sovereign crisis that flashed for a second there with the UK uh, last year. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this narrative that's out there that we're in this weird, perverse world where developed sovereigns are maybe riskier than uh, emerging sovereigns. Yeah, I don't really buy that. Like, and it turns out, this is one of the weird things about that crazy, you know, Liz Truss, UK stock market crash, that there were a bunch of like really bizarre technical reasons why it happened. You know, that it was... When we when it first happened, there was this narrative that there was a bunch of like bond market vigilantes flexing their muscles for the first time since the 1990s, and that suddenly, you know, fiscal policy could really bring down a, a currency, a country, and then it turned out that there was just like a bunch of weird market dynamics by pension funds and the way they accounted for their future liabilities, which explained most of what happened and in a little weird way i hate to admit this like liz truss did get a little bit unlucky that way but obviously you know she should have known what she was doing in general i think what we have seen especially with fiscal policy in the united states over the past three years with you know or even longer than three years if you go back to the trump tax cuts is that fiscal policy has an enormous there's enormous amount of fiscal space for rich countries to do basically anything they want. And meanwhile, in the developing world, if you look at the series of defaults that you know, started with Zambia, and then we have Ghana, and many other African countries, and a few even outside Africa, like we are back to a world of big, problematic sovereign defaults in the, de in the developing world, just because they don't have that luxury of being able to you know, control their own currencies and borrow in their own currencies. So, yeah, I think we're, we, we are not in a world where the United States is riskier than Ghana. When, like that, we, we have fiscal space in, in a way that developing countries do not, and, and we can borrow in our own currency, and that is incredibly valuable. And I think that people got very confused about what happened in the UK, and it was difficult to understand. But the big picture is it's still incredibly valuable to be a rich country that can and does borrow in its own currency. Right, so, so that part clearly didn't uh, change post-COVID the role of the U.S. We'll get into the reserve currency dynamic uh, in a bit here. Let's talk about um, things that people say changed post-COVID that really didn't, where the narratives are wrong. And from your work, from your research, from your vantage point, what changed the most uh, post-COVID? There's a bunch of different answers to that. Um, depending on how sort of hand wavy and conceptual you want to get. In terms of real specifics, I would say that the biggest change that I've seen has been the way in which the value of commercial real estate and office space has moved out of commercial real estate itself and office buildings into residential real estate and one of the reasons why residential real estate is so expensive right now is because there's so much demand within housing for people to have some kind of a home office some kind of a place to work and the way that our desires in terms of how we want our living spaces to be architected and how we don't want big cathedral ceilings and three-car garages anymore so much as smaller private spaces where we can close the door and do homework or do work work 
and and interact with our friends, even if they're not in the house, but just through screens. I think that is going to really change the architecture of houses for decades to come. It is here to stay. And the desire and the amount of not only the number of rooms that people need, but just the, the amount of square footage that people think they need has gone up substantially. And that's, I mean, I'm going to make the assumption that's primarily a developed economy uh, dynamic, right? I mean, you go to emerging countries, you go to India, um, you know, office buildings are not as important because most, you know, will work from home or do IT type work uh, remotely. I'm not sure, to be honest. Like, I mean, obviously the... Like I feel like the way in which the internet has taken over, especially in China, India is a bit of a special case, and it kind of depends where in India you are. Like India is not a big homogenous country in this in that sense, but there's a lot of countries that have kind of leapfrogged in terms of development straight into the wired smartphone connected era, and and that ability to be able to interact online with your friends and do work remotely from home that you used to be have to go physically go somewhere to do that is not a uniquely american or even developed country thing that is something that you see around the planet i mean it, you know ukraine was a rich country it wasn't a very rich country but the degree to which the Ukrainian economy has been able to withstand a full-scale war with you know thousands of people dying in in the war and use the connectivity of the internet to be able to continue to provide you know services to to companies around the world has been really astonishing the in the rich i mean admittedly this is a rich country thing but actually no it's global look at what happened with banks around the world it didn't matter whether they were American banks or South African banks or Chinese banks or Indian banks, when they when their workforces stopped going into the office, stopped going into the bank to do their work and started having to work remotely, the entire global banking system was fine. And I don't think anyone really predicted that. Bankers will always have told you that this is a highly secure, you know, they have all these layers of infosec and the like that require people to be in the office and go through security protocols. And then when that couldn't happen, all the banking systems in the world pretty much were fine. And so around the world, we really discovered the degree to which workspace, the place that we work, could actually be outside the office in a way that theoretically we might have had an inkling of that pre-pandemic, but in practice, we never really took advantage of it. Presumably, though, the the systemic risk, if there is any, is going to be primarily from the U.S. side, given the way commercial real estate's uh, been impacted, just because of the starting point of leverage. I mean, much more financialization in the U.S. than other countries that have this dynamic. So while commercial real estate might be challenged in other places, it could have, I would think, other broader ramifications on the financial system. Uh, given the way uh, transactions take place and debt loads in general. Yeah, I think, honestly, I think the upsides here are much bigger than the downsides. There, There is a certain amount of downside in terms of commercial real estate loans. But the great thing about commercial real estate loans is that even if they default, you know, the building is still there and you can still use it and it still has value. And those defaults are a little bit like, corporate you know checks classic chapter 11 bankruptcies where the entity just keeps on going and, and all you're really doing is changing the ownership structure if a commercial real estate building stops being owned by this group of owners and starts being owned by that group of lenders you know there are going to be some losses among lenders and as we said the bond markets care about that kind of thing but i don't see a huge systemic repercussion to that when you have residential real estate being so strong. And I think this is the, we should be looking at the other side of the coin here, which is this dynamic is really strengthening demand for residential real estate and keeping residential prices high in a way that means that credit quality in the mortgage market is higher than ever and means that we are not going to have another replay of you know, the 2008 financial crisis, which really came from residential rather than commercial. And residential is much, much 
bigger than commercial. Yeah, no, that, that, that part makes sense. Okay, now, obviously, the other thing that changed post-COVID is um, the usage of memes for <laughs> for investing, <laughs> for lack of a better way of saying it. Um, and, and I don't know, yeah, we can argue about whether it's generational or something else, but I, I want to, I know you addressed this in the book, you want to talk about the sort of generational differences in terms of how to think about uh, investing. Is that is that something because of COVID accelerating it, or you know, is there something else that has resulted in this weird environment where fundamentals matter a lot less than uh, they used to? So there's a, a bunch of questions embedded in that. I do make the case in the book that there is something generational going on. The, there's a big difference in the way that boomers and Gen X invested, and then there's another big difference between the way that either of them invest in the way that millennials have invested. And a lot of that was connected to the pandemic. A lot of millennials really didn't have any money in the market until the pandemic because they had a huge amount of student debt and they didn't have particularly high incomes and they were saving up for trying to buy a house and all of this kind of stuff. And so they weren't stock market investors until the pandemic comes along. They're stuck at home. They're getting their stimulus checks and that and and suddenly like this world that they understand this is the you know extremely online generation suddenly this world that they understand of of reddit and memes and 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 like social investing starts becoming a real reality it's something to do and they jump in and they're not coming at this from a point of view of let me maximize my long term internal rate of return so that I have retirement income in 50 years time, right? They're coming at this from a point of view of, I want to get rich quick. And I'm relatively early on in my money saving days. So if I lose all of the money I invest right now, you know, it's painful, but it's not the end of the world. And so that's what happened. They started taking taking enormous risks. They started almost boasting about how much money they would lose on, you know, in Reddit forums and that kind of thing. And investing became like a fun game to play rather than like this deeply serious thing that that you know finance professors like to think of it as. And so that that was generational, it was pandemic related, and it's not disappeared. It's definitely much quieter now than it was you know in the winter of 2021 but that dream of getting rich quick and by and being able to get rich quick through crypto or meme stocks or whatever the flavor of the month is hasn't gone away that still lives on and it will come back at some point you know what's amazing is that if you remember with the gamestop and the whole uh, reddit roaring kitty and return of retail narrative that's out there I always go back to that mark the top for almost all stocks in February of late January uh, 2021, early February 2021. That's when breadth for the marketplace started weakening. So as much as everyone was hyped around meme stocks, that was actually uh, the moment that things started turning. I wonder um, how much of that dynamic do you think relates to sort of a uh, a mentality of more than just get rich quick, but there's no other way to make it unless you – uh, kind of go all in and, and YOLO. I, I, I've had people say to me when I pose the question, why would you even bother investing in stocks when you can get a guaranteed 4 or 5% in bonds? Uh, they say, well, because you're not going to get anywhere with 4 or 5% with inflation where it is, so you might as well just gamble because there's no hope otherwise. Um, do you think there's sort of a level of, for lack of a better way of saying it, despair uh, among a younger generation that drives some of this behavior? I, I would say maybe – cynicism about how like you know the boomers have all the money and they always will have all the money and and there's none of it left over for the rest of us and this mentality of just always being behind and never having much to invest and so the only way to get rich is to get rich quickly because you're never going to get rich slowly a lot of that is based in 13 years of zero interest rates right from 2008 through up until this latest hiking cycle, we had a little bit of a bump in the middle of it there. But in general, we have we were operating under a zero interest rate policy for so long, and the Fed was so good at saying, you know, 
forward guidance, like we're going to keep those zero interest rates for 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 a long time. Plus, it was global. You know, the European interest rates were even low, lower; they were negative. And so, the magic of compound interest that like the boomers would talk about all the time, you know, disappeared. It just evaporated. You can't have compound interest when interest rates are at zero. And to your point, in real terms, arguably, interest rates are still at zero. You know, we have inflation at 4.9% and Fed funds at 5.25%. That's basically the same, right? So in real terms, we still have zero interest rate policy. And if you have zero interest rates, then you can't compound and you can't get rich slowly. And so you do need to start taking much bigger risks. You mentioned the the Reddit side and the idea of people boasting about how much they lost. Uh, I've always been a little bit cynical around some of these narratives in thinking that a lot of these accounts that would argue that uh, are anonymous, which means nobody knows if it's if it's a retail person that's actually going through that loss or maybe some institutional player that's trying to manipulate emotions online. Do you, get a, do you have a sense of sort of how how real some of these commentaries are? If the if there are legitimately a lot of individuals that are making stupid amounts of money and losing stupid amounts of money, or is it is it a facade that's you know kind of fooling everybody? I would say the former that the overwhelming majority of posting that you see on Wall Street bets and places like that is um, you can take it at face value and it is what it says it is. I, I think that there are certainly a large number of you know smaller hedge fund managers who, especially around 2021, realized that the Wall Street bets crowd could drive the market. And so they started paying much more attention to those message boards and they started trying to, you know, take the other side of a lot of those trades and make money from them. And, you know, broadly speaking, of course, if you think about all of the trading that it's done on Robinhood and all of these apps, you know, all of it is is low information retail flow, and you get big players like Knight and Citadel and Virtue on the other side of all of those trades just making a fortune, right? So it's not like the institutional world isn't highly aware of what's going on and is, isn't trying to make money from it. But I don't think that the way they're trying to make money from it is by creating sock puppets to put posts up on Wall Street bets and try and influence the market that way. I think they're being that. Yeah, I think I think of all the ways to do it, that's the least likely to work. Part of this also, also I think, is just um, COVID reminded everybody about mortality and you know, there was a time there where people didn't know if they'd be around next week. And, you know, now you came out of that. So that creates a degree of live life now, take more risks, YOLO into not just, you know, some meme coin or NFT, but spend as much as you can on travel after COVID. And that creates the infl- a lot of the inflation, I'd argue, that we also have now, demand poll driven. At some point, presumably, that tails off, though, right? I mean, people end up having short memories at the end of the day, uh, and five years can be a short memory. You allude to the idea that you think that a lot of these d- dynamics will come back. If they come back, you think they're going to come back with the same degree of fervor? I mean, you don't have zero interest rate policy anymore, and the further we get away from COVID, the less likely people are going to be, I think, feeling that they might die tomorrow so spend as much today as possible. Yes. Uh, we, you know, these effects, there's a good case to be made that they will diminish over time. But I think there's also just been a really big secular change in how people think. That that deep YOLO attitude is not like a conscious thing necessarily. It's people aren't spending more on restaurants because they are, you know, going through a conscious line of reasoning saying, Well, I only live once and I could die tomorrow, so I should enjoy life while I can. But I think their risk appetite for a lot, I go into this in some detail in the book, is that what you saw is risk appetite in general go up significantly in both good ways and bad ways. And people are now in the habit of spending much more on experiences and, much, and relatively less on, on things. And that is, that is a hard habit to break. Once you started traveling, once you started going to restaurants, once you started – getting used to the idea that, you know, $300 a night is not a crazy amount of money to spend on a hotel, then at that point, you're in that mindset and you need something to break you out of it. And a lot of people have entered that mindset now. 
and they're going to be there for the foreseeable future. How has the uh, post-COVID uh, environment impacted relationship building? And we went from you know face to face to having to build relationships more via screens. There was this kind of long-running question or joke about, yeah, you know, are there going to be uh, more babies born or uh, more divorces <laughs> because of the lockdown? <laughs> yeah. if you recall back then. Um, I- I'm curious if you've seen anything that would suggest that uh, relationships have have almost permanently changed because of the acceleration of technology to develop relationships. So I ha- I didn't go into a huge amount of of detail on that one. I promised my friend Taffy that there would be a lot of sex in the book, and then I failed. And so this if 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 the book doesn't sell millions of copies, it's because I didn't listen to her and I didn't put enough sex in the book. So I do think that the reopening yeah, I, do you remember the hot back summer of twenty twenty one? Like where everyone was like, Oh my god, we can go out and touch people again and doesn't doesn't it feel amazing to go out and touch people again? That felt good, but the big long term secular trends of younger people are having less and less sex were seemingly largely unaffected by COVID. And I think that's that's going to remain the case, that people just have much less sex than they ever used to in previous decades. Which is real shame. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is. I think everyone agrees on that. No, and I've kind of joked about that. I think that I, I, what I remember I once put a uh, – I saw some study around that, and I said I blamed uh, I blamed Bitcoin or I blamed cryptocurrency. <laughs> but but I think it's – Yeah, Bitcoin does not solve this. No. We know that. <laughs> that's right. Exactly right. Well, unless Bitcoin goes to a million, in which case it might solve it. But that, that's a whole other uh, – but, but I guess where I'm going with that is I do think there's – it kind of goes back to this generational question, right? I mean the generation of old had to develop relationships face-to-face – generation of now uh, has access to video games and, and metaverse type things and a lot more sort of virtual escapism, which which maybe results in a degree of not needing to actually socialize. And COVID, you can argue, uh, accelerated a lot of that dynamic. And that then dovetails into YOLOing because it's certainly easier to buy a meme coin than open up a whole brokerage account uh, to buy a stock and deal with all that. Yeah, and and the importance of video games for socialization really can't be overemphasized. You know that Fortnite is the biggest social network that no one really thinks of as a social network, and it's how people interact. It's the natural way to interact with people, with with your friends. And people spend much more time with their friends. A lot of people, especially young men, spend a lot more time with their friends in the context of playing video games with them, and they can be thousands of miles away from each other in in physical space, but like right in the same virtual space. And that is the reason why someone like Mark Zuckerberg became so convinced that the metaverse was going to be such a big thing, right? Because that was proved by, by the video game industry that people will just take what used to have to be physical contact and can replace it with virtual contact. The thing that didn't happen, of course, was that it became all tied in with cryptocurrency and that people would use that kind of mechanism to interact in a professional context rather than in a gaming context. But in principle, like in terms of just socialization, especially among younger men, yeah, doing so through screens is entirely, entirely natural now, and it will not go away. Yeah, I guess my point is I would still relate that to the initial direction of sort of the idea that there's a degree of despair which creates the YOLO mentality. Uh, I've long believed that the metaverse, you know, probably will work because it's a form of escapism from people that don't have hope around real life. So they get the Lambos from a virtual world, not in the real life world. And the more they're on their screens, like on Instagram, we know there's a sort of depression effect that comes from social media, right? That it just causes more and more people to not want to associate with other people in person. As far as uh, things that you think maybe change temporarily and are kind of going back to normal post-COVID, whether it's societal, economic, whatever it would be, what's something that people would argue uh, in you know, 2020, 2021 change or would change forever that ended up falling flat? C- cities, right? Do you remember Do you remember the narrative that like – Cities were dead. Everyone was going to leave cities. Cities were dangerous. Cities were, where, where, you know, you were crammed together and were much more dangerous. So everyone was going to move to Boise. And, you know, Boy- Boise property prices went up by 50%. And then they went back down again. And it turns out that cities are just as important as they always were. 
and in fact, are more desirable in many ways. I can tell you as someone who lives in New York that what has astonished me is the demand for rental property in New York City being driven by you know 25-year-olds who aren't coming to New York because that's where their jobs are, right? They can work anywhere. They have remote work jobs, and they are coming to New York because that's it's the center of the universe, right? That's where the life is. That's where the, you know, that's where the vivacity is. And that desire and need to come into New York is, has overwhelmed the outflow of, you know, younger boomers who are like, I'm sick of this place. I'm moving to Putnam County. Right. And so the cities have, have become rejuvenated and stronger and, you know, they've lost some of their higher earners. And so in terms of municipal finance, there's maybe a few issues going on there. But the strength of cities as, as real engines of the future of the economy that has only really strengthened rather than weakened. What about, um, for lack of a better way of saying it, the, uh, the number of scams, and I'm going you know beyond sort of you know, PPP and all that. It's, I've interviewed a number of people who have argued that uh, we're in this kind of golden age of fraud. Maybe that's because of mm-hmm. cryptocurrencies. Maybe that's because of too much money. Who knows? But I'm curious to hear your thoughts on if we're in this kind of era where um, there's a lot more caveat on poor uh, now than there ever was. So one of the most undercovered aspects of the pandemic, and I wrote about this in, in some depth, but not in the book, was the amount of unemployment fraud. That, that, that we saw and just staggering, staggering amounts of unemployment for what the, you know, the lower end of the estimates is $200 billion and it goes up from there, much of which was very sophisticated international crime rings in places like Russia, who, or China or Nigeria, who managed to work out how they could get databases of social security numbers and address names and addresses and apply for unemployment in multiple states and and just and, and they found all the loopholes and they were smarter and faster than any of the states were in terms of being able to put up defenses against that meanwhile the states were basically in the mindset of we've got to get this money out the door that's the most important thing and if some of it gets lost to fraud that's a price worth paying in order to be able to save the economy and i kind of have sympathy with that but yeah, that was the number by that that amount of fraud dwarfs anything that you saw at you know FTX or, or even you know any of the other big name frauds that we can think of, right? But yeah, there was this feeling of trust that we had from seventy years of relatively stable society from nineteen forty five to twenty fifteen, right? And we kind of got into this zone of like, if something feels like a bank, it's probably safe because banks are basically safe. And if something looks like an investment, then there's someone looking out for me and it's probably not a fraud. And it's only when you get a major crisis, like the COVID crisis, that you suddenly, that things break. You know, it was only when we had the financial crisis of 2008 that the Madoff Ponzi was finally uncovered, right? Because everyone was just so comfortable in it that they were never going to find it out otherwise. And so, yeah, we, we always like fraud is always with us, but definitely that period of calm and trust in institutions, like helped to make it easier to do frauds like FTX. You know, for instance, Coinbase has been coming out over and over again saying, what we're doing is legal because the SEC allowed us to go public. And the SEC is saying that, no, I'm sorry, we never said that what you were doing was legal. We just allowed you to go public. And that's true. Like it could be that, you know, SEC, that Coinbase, the entire basis of that company of, you know, making markets in a whole bunch of different coins, that those coins are securities, that they're not a licensed securities broker and everything they've been doing has been illegal. And that certainly seems to be the message that Gary Gensler is sending. And yeah, and we were all kind of just okay with it. And we were like, yeah, it's probably fine. You know, it's listed on the stock market. How how illegal can it be? Yeah, it's funny you say that. That, um, that kind of goes into sort of this, this bigger question for me, which is how behavior has 
changed or perhaps gotten accentuated in certain ways. So I'm a big fan of behavioral finance and, you know, thinking about heuristics. It's my sense that um, post-COVID, everyone is now much more system one uh, reactionary, to use Daniel Kahneman's way of looking at things, uh, versus system two, you know, kind of more purposeful thinking. Um, and that very point you just brought up is entirely system. Well, one, well, if it looks like a bank, then yeah, our reaction is it must be a bank, must be safe, right? Or if it's if it's approved by the SEC, well, then it must be legal. It, do, you, do you think there's anything to the idea that in the post-COVID environment, we've become much more primal in the way that we don't think about things? We're just responding and reacting as opposed to thinking? Or is that just maybe me seeing that from social media accentuating that. I love Danny Kahneman. He's a, 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 to, a total hero of mine. And I interviewed him on stage a few years ago. And I asked him, you know, if we understand this whole distinction between system one and system two, and if we decide to ourselves, like, I want to be more considered and thoughtful about things. And I don't just want to be in the sort of system one mode of reacting all the time without really thinking things through. Is there a way that, you know, having read your book and being conscious of this kind of thing can help me be more mindful? And he just looked at me like I had three heads and said, no way. Like, that's what I'm doing. What I'm talking about is deeply ingrained in being human. It's a necessary part of being an animal, which we all are. Right. And that system one is what keeps us alive. And if we had to think about anything, we would just starve. And we can see the lack of joined up thinking all around us, maybe more obviously now in the age of social media, because social media amplifies a lot of the visibility of these kind of, of these kind of behaviors. But the behaviors themselves are eternal and cannot be overcome. And, you know, Kahneman himself has said, like, you know, I can't do it. Just because I know I'm biased does not mean I can overcome that bias. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's that's fair. And, and uh, I guess it's more in maybe the availability heuristic uh, that I myself have fallen for in terms of just <laughs> seeing it uh, out there. So as, as uh, and everybody here, please make sure to follow uh, Felix Salmon here on Twitter and check out, obviously, The Phoenix Economy, uh, which is recently released, uh, if you're interested in learning more about some of uh, Felix's work post-COVID. But in the research that you did for the book, and just like every other author, you're doing your research, was there anything that was noteworthy as something that surprised you? Something that, in putting together the book, was something you either had not considered when living it over the last three years, or something that maybe you had a misconception of that, you know, the research kind of righted for you? So the really big one, I mean, there were a few, but the really big one was that all the way through 2020, after I'd sold the book and I was writing about the economy and writing about, you know, are we going to have a, a K-shaped recovery or a, you know, reverse square root shape recovery or an I-shaped recovery, like, like Mario Rubini said, or, you know, what all of these kind of things. The thing that I really believed was that the recession of 2020 had been caused by the virus. And it meant that we couldn't touch each other. We couldn't interact with each other. And that the only way to get the economy back was by dealing with the virus and basically making sure that COVID w went away in some way. And I couldn't have been more wrong about that. The thing that really shocked me was the strength of the recovery in the face of the virus just getting deadlier and deadlier. We had the Delta wave and then we had the Omicron wave and the number of deaths just kept on going up and up and we you know, went over a million deaths in the United States. And we rebuilt the economy around the virus and we stopped caring about people dying. And there was a real sense in which, you know, these, you know, literally million people who died in America of COVID, we were kind of like, oh, yeah, okay. And just kind of stopped caring about it at some point. And, you know, we're still having a thousand people a week die of COVID today. And we have, lifted the state of emergency and said, like, yeah, it's basically behind us now. You know, we have an official declaration from the White House that to all intents and purposes, we are living in a post-COVID economy, even though COVID is very much out there and very much still killing people. And it's going to be one of the top killers of Americans for as many years as we can foresee. So that was the thing that surprised me the most. 
was the degree to which the economy could reconstitute itself around the virus without actually the, us having to properly eradicate the virus, develop herd immunity or anything like that in order to recover. So the other argument, of course, is that all this just accelerated already existing trends. Um, but were there totally new trends that weren't in existence pre-COVID that you uncover that you think have really interesting long-term ramifications on society, that it's more than just an acceleration of existing dynamics? No, I don't think anything brand new came up. I think in order, you know, as, as anyone, any central banker will tell you, if you're doing like FX intervention, you want to always intervene when you have the wind behind you and the, and the currency is kind of moving in the direction you want it to already. So it's a lot easier to accelerate an existing trend than it is to build something completely new. But I do think that the way in which we all had our own mental health crisis over the course of the pandemic was really profound that we all kind of that we all have much more compassion now for mental health health issues like i noticed that the prince harry memoir was the fastest selling non-fiction book in the history of the planet and yeah that's a little bit because he's a famous royal but it's also because it's a book about mental health and people care about that and they have more compassion for it it has become destigmatized to an astonishing degree in an astonishingly short amount of time and that is for the positive and i think the speed with which that stigma went away has shocked a lot of people to the upside you know it's a pleasant surprise is there anything to the idea that um post covid we've become more political or more uh, extreme in political views as a society? Again, this is more than just, you know, Trump, right? I mean, it seems like in general, there's just um, a faction of the society, which is extreme right, extreme left, the middle doesn't get any attention. And we know that COVID did become kind of a political hot button and narrative. Yeah, COVID certainly didn't help. I mean, when I talk about the 70 years of peace and prosperity following the Second World War, I deliberately stop it in 2016 rather than 2020, right? Because 2016 was the year for me where we had the Brexit vote and we had the Trump vote. And I was like, okay, something is very different now and much more bifurcated and much angrier and much more incommensural, incommensurate, like between the two sides. There's, there's not really any scope for compromise anymore. You know, it's not always like that. Switzerland still has a unified government without any kind of opposition. So if you're Switzerland, I guess you're fine. If you're Sweden, you're fine. But I, th I think you're right that politics is deeply bifurcated, fractured, broken. And you can see that right now in the whole debt ceiling fiasco. I Again, I would say probably that's an acceleration of pre-existing trends, though, rather than something particularly pandemic-related. I, I was not surprised to see the pandemic become politicized, because anything that important inevitably becomes politicized these days. Final question, then we'll wrap up. And everybody, please make sure you follow uh, Felix here on Twitter and check out The Phoenix Economy. If we were to say that we're in, as your subtitle alludes to, right, kind of a the new not normal, will we ever go back to you know, the old normal? Or is this a, a permanent structural shift in society? It's beyond just the way that people work, it's the way that people interact. Um, yeah, no, I'm saying it's a permanent shift. And if anything, like, ironically speaking, the old normal was the aberrant period. If you go back, if you take the long term historical view, if you look back at the history of plagues over the past 1000 years, that period of going 100 years without a pandemic was unprecedented and really weird and not normal. You know, that kind of stability that we imposed upon the world in the wake of the Second World War by building all of these international geopolitical institutions was unprecedented and not really normal in terms of how the world normally works. I guess my big thesis is that this kind of era of volatility and unexpected risks that we now find ourselves in is actually over a big sort of thousand year time horizon the normal and it's just compared to the you know that slightly aberrant post-war period that it feels not normal yeah it's a, a good place to wrap this twitter space up thank you very much for joining uh thank you felix for your time as well